Welcome to another episode of Extra Time with Girls on the Bull. I'm delighted to say we've got Manchester United and Republic of Ireland defender and FA Cup finalist Aoife Mannion as our super sub today. Welcome to the pod Aoife, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, I'm really looking forward to it. How are you feeling after last weekend? Not only getting through to another FA Cup final, but beating Chelsea for the first time. Oh, we are so buzzing. We're absolutely delighted. Um, the couple of days later when we usually do our analysis, it was more like a montage video of like some of the good stuff from the game. Usually we get like proper in the details and we're sort of picking it apart, good things, bad things, what we need to do better. But this was like total indulgence. We were just watching some, you know, watching the goals from different angles and all the good stuff basically. And so we rode that way for a few days. We've been like soaking that in. Obviously that's going to have to come to an end. You know, we've got our next game and, and so on. Um, but definitely we're on cloud nine, not just because we got to the FA Cup final, but also as a team, it's like you said, our first time that we've managed to topple Chelsea in a game. And I think that is okay to say that that's like a, you know, a really good thing for us. I think it shows the level that Chelsea are at, the dominance that they have in the WSL. And so it's all right to sort of go, you know what, that's actually really cool. I think that's the thing, isn't it? Like once you topple a team for the first time who have been sort of your nemesis for quite a long time in, in the league and, and in the Cups. So so once you get that over that hurdle, it's like, a I guess, a, a relief. And, you know, that when the next time that you play them, it's going to be a massive source of, I guess, um, encouragement. Definitely. Uh, until I saw the referee put the whistle towards her mouth, I, I really thought that the game was like not cut and dry at all and that Chelsea are a team, they're so good that anything can happen any minute and it, they don't necessarily need momentum on their side. They don't need to look like they've been creating chances. They don't need necessarily loads of possession. They've got brilliant, brilliant players who can just hurt you in the slightest moment. And so usually maybe if you you can kind of get a feel for things and think, you know, okay, like, yeah, we're in the driving seat. No, we, we did not. Well, I personally didn't have that at all. I thought every moment just needs so much concentration. And what was interesting then is when we got sent our sort of like GPS and loading data from the game actually wasn't that high. It wasn't like astronomical, but yet we all say, wow, we feel so tired from that game because it was obviously so emotionally draining, just trying to concentrate so hard. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Like toppling a team for the first time, it, it then shifts the sort of psychology and dynamic. It doesn't mean that going into a game against Chelsea again, you know, they've, they've still got incredible players. They've still got uh, all of the same things hold, but knowing that you'd be a team, I think it does change things. Yeah, definitely. I um, I spoke to Mary post-match about finally getting that win over Chelsea. And she said, every time you played them, you'd say, today is the day, today's the time we're going to beat them. What made Sunday different? Like, what was it? Do you think it was always, like, it was always coming or was it Wembley that kind of, Gave you that extra motivation? I actually don't know. I don't know in particular, like whether it was written in the stars or anything like that. We had the maddest start ever, went 2 0 up really quick into the game. And the crowd actually were like really feeling it. Everything we did that was good. And I think a good measure of the crowd is when you're defensively quite good. The crowd will like cheer you if you make a big block or if the if Mary makes a save, they'll like really get behind. And I think that's, it kind of, it, I imagine that was really difficult to be on the opposite team and, and feel that's really deflating. Uh, and so there was a little bit of that. And then I don't know, like genuinely, I, like until the referee put, put the whistle in her mouth, I, I did not think it was necessarily written in the stars for us, but that level of grittiness and sort of resilience that we had in the game, regardless of the outcome. Um, it, funny enough, I was saying to Mary yesterday, like that was really special. Like you can feel it as a player and we, we like to try and bottle that up and put, you know, sort of put a finger on it. It's really hard to like figure out what that was where you think, wow, like it's all for one, one for all. We're just all on the exact same page. Um, all really encouraging, but really direct. It's like really hard to get that balance um, 
it kind of just came together. And, you know, the the stats after the game are no, no surprise that the, the level of dominance statistically from, from Chelsea in terms of possession. Um, and then here we are going to the FA Cup final and I just feel very lucky and grateful that we've been able to put ourselves in this position. That start though, like... I'm assuming the game plan was to try and get a quick start and to hit Chelsea early, but I barely had my arse on my photography seat before the ball was in the back of the net. Like, we, we totally missed it. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I don't know, I can't remember exactly. I think oh, it would have been a bit before when I saw you in the tunnel before the game. Yes. To sit alone. Um, yeah, like, obviously we know we need to start fast but it wouldn't have been necessarily in the, you know, at no point in the week was, was that mentioned so specifically, Oh, now we're just, you know, Leah's going to cross the ball in and Lucia's going to jump up and head the ball in the net, like within a minute, that's just not on the cards. And so it, it felt like a gift. It was like, we were given a gift and then we got another gift in terms of being so clinical, so effective. And to be fair, a lot of people would probably argue with the word gift, I say gift in terms of how it felt. Actually, Leah and Tooney can put those crosses in all day long. So it's it's skill, but it just felt in, a gift in terms of the start that we really wanted. You know, we actually we actually got. And then I guess you said in the second half that you never really felt like it was <laughs> it was done and dusted. I think actually from the outside looking in. Um, you know, there was that stressful moment, maybe the first 10 minutes of the second half when they really came at you. And while you had to deal with those waves of constant Chelsea attack, beyond that, they didn't really stress you all that much, but maybe you didn't feel that as a defensive line. Yeah, it, it, it's it's weird because they had the ball for so much of the second half, but you're right in a sense of how many clear moments did they like cut through us with passes Um I'm, I'm, there, there would have been moments, but it wasn't like a common theme that we were like getting take, you know, caught off guard and there was passes that were ripping us apart. What they did have was like floods of players and they're able to push their fullbacks higher and really kind of ramp up their overloads on a back line, whereas most teams won't do that. Most teams won't commit quite so many players forward because naturally you're thinking, well, what happens when the ball turns over? But just because they've got really good players, they can afford to do that, which is just so uncomfortable to defend against. Um, and so that's why it felt, you know, in, in the first half, for example, I, I obviously played right back. It didn't feel like there was a whole lot going on down my side, but then just like that, a one to cross into the box goal, Chelsea. And so even though it didn't necessarily, it might not have looked from the side like something was brewing or coming at every moment of second half, it definitely felt like it could happen at any moment if we switched off. Yeah, you just have to be super alert to it, I guess. What is it like as a defender when you do see the likes of Macario and Frank Kirby come off the bench? Because you know, must have, like 75 minutes in, you must be like, oh, oh God, <laughs> do I have to deal with this still? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like incredible players to come off the bench and players that have quite different profiles. Like as a defender, you get quite used to sort of defending against your, you know, player that's set up against you and, you know, they'll have characteristics and preferences of what they like to do on the ball. And then, you know, Chelsea's depth in their squad, they can bring players on that are really quite different. And, it, you know, that can catch you off guard. It can sort of take you a few minutes to kind of figure out, OK, when the player gets the ball like this, they're going to run this way. And, you know, it re makes you really kind of cagey and hesitant. Um, and then obviously right at the end, Nikita Paris, who came on for us, she dropped in and made it like a five at the back. She kind of played as a bit of a wing back. So, I guess we dealt with it by sort of putting more players lower in, in, on the pitch um, and sort of did what we needed to do to then see out the result. But interestingly, it was probably right at that time at the end where we maybe looked like most likely to score uh, when it got really kind of transitional and, you know, Chelsea were committing players forward. And then we seemed to get a few quite nice chances on the break. There was obviously um, a disallowed goal. So a bit of a funky game in that sense. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, it now means Wembley awaits. Um, talk us through last year's experience, I suppose, because I imagine that's something you drew on before that Chelsea game, the hurt of, of losing in the final. Um, you came on in the second half, right? So as a team, you've experienced that. How much was that part of the conversation in preparation? 
it wasn't it we didn't specifically talk loads about the final because the personnel were di- were different um and in like it's who's on the pitch in terms of like get specific game plans and formations and stuff like that and sometimes things don't need to be said you know everyone knows the significance for a team to beat Chelsea but not beat them before everyone knows the significance of beating a team to get to the FA Cup final when that team is uh, you know they're the FA Cup um holders and so even though we didn't reference it so directly there was like a sense of like come on girls like are we up for this are we gonna have a really good go here um and so yeah it implicitly definitely would, would be on our minds and the hurt of last year and feeling like we've got so close and we've done so well and kind of so close but yet so far like nearly but like nearly doesn't get you there um and hopefully that experience as well of the novelty as a team of getting to Wembley isn't there this year um, you, you know, we all we always say when we're doing things for the first time, or we'll play the game, not the occasion. But actually, when you walk out at Wembley in front of all those fans, you know these kind of little cute like one-liners of "all oh, will focus on performance." It can be very, very overwhelming. And the only thing that gets you over that is actually being there. And that's why I've never been in a team that have that have been in that experience where we've had more experience and that hopefully will be the case this year in terms of, you know, Mary Earps, that's pro- you know, pretty much her second garden uh, and, and <laughs> same for Tooney. And so the fact that we've been there before, I really, really hope that that holds us in good stead because I feel like it was something that shifted the odds the other way when the shoe's been on the other foot. Yeah, I guess as well, like whether or not it's something that, affects you emotionally it's still something you have to think about because you haven't experienced it before so you have to deal with the emotion of how you're going to deal with it if that makes sense and whether or not it's something that impacts you it's still something you have to give thought to before the game whereas if you've experienced before that's not something you really have to contend with and it's one less thing I suppose to prepare for right you definitely and it's just the atmosphere it's the uh, like it's the it's the amount of people that are there and the fact that you can't really hear anyone on the pitch is a lot. And so the grooves and the routines that you get into when you're at your home ground and maybe there's five or 6,000, it's not there when there's 60, 70,000. It, it feels like a different kettle of fish. Um, what's been a big thing for us as a team is playing more games in big stadiums. So that element is kind of not as much of a thing as Maybe it would have been like back in 2017 when I got to the FA Cup final with Birmingham. That was just astronomical. It's not that same jump now. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, le- it's learning to train for those situations as well. And I guess drawing on that is Tottenham haven't been there before, your opponent in the FA Cup final. So I guess that could be considered an advantage for you in, in some ways, the fact that you have experienced it, experienced that crowd, experienced that feeling of being at like the showpiece event, um, one of the showpiece events of the year. So you could draw on that more than they can probably. It's definitely an advantage to, to having been there before. That's how it feels. Like as a player, I'm very grateful that I've been there before. Um, can't speak for what their experience will be and they're going to need to draw on all sorts of motivations, like how incredible a season they've been having, how brilliant they've been playing, how coordinated they look. They've done so well to get to the final. They absolutely deserve it. Um, And then that's going to be their own thing. For us, what we're going to be drawing on is we've been here before. We've come so close. Now it's let's see if we can take it a step forward. In a classic uh, Barclays WSL coincidence, you are playing Tottenham this weekend, (laughs) which is like absolute peak WSL. Is that like, I mean, how do you genuinely, how do you approach these kind of games? I know everyone would always say it's one game at a time and we don't think about what's coming next. But it is one of those, I suppose, where a team can suss out another team or can hold their cards close to their chest or can like consider what's more important in terms of what you put out and display on the pitch. Yeah, oh, like people have been asking me this. What a coincidence, by the way. People have been asking same things like, do you hold your cards close to your chest? And my answer is like, well, what cards? 
Like it's not that you hold players back or like like it's not that actually, let's say for me, I'm a one one v one defender. Actually, I'm going to play like someone different. Like <laughs> I say, on a personal level, you sort of are what you are and Tottenham will have watched footage of us and we'll have watched footage from them. Potentially would a tactic be slightly different? Maybe, but I think the things that dictate the games are the profile of the players, which are quite constant. Um, and I really don't don't know like what the manager might have up like Mark Ma- might have up his sleeve in terms of like some cute and sly tactics. I'm not sure, but mostly you just want to win the game. How much of an advantage is it going into a final having won a league match a few weeks before? I'm not I'm not sure. Like the FA Cup has that feel about it that it's like all or nothing on the day. And what's happened before, forget about it. What what matters is now, but I'd be lying if I said that I didn't want to go into that game having won a few weeks before. So it, it's it's a weird one. I don't know if I'm giving you a straight answer. I don't really know, but I do know that we we really want to win. Obviously, at the weekend, it's may, maybe you kind of put your flag in the ground and kind of go, "This is us." Um, but I don't. I, th- I think regardless of the outcome, it, it's not going to be the the deal breaker you know, in the final, that's going to be its own beast. I guess as well, when you kind of look at the season at Manchester United and there has been a few ups and downs, maybe a lack of consistency in the league here and there. And this could be really used as that kind of motivation to push on for this last block of games. How has it been this season dealing with that kind of lack of consistency at times? Yeah, like it's no, it's no, it's no, I'm looking for the word surprise. Is that the word? It's no, no surprise that, you know, I'm not saying new information by saying that we've not done as well in some ways that that, that that than what we would have wanted to at the beginning of the year. Like at the beginning of the year, the beginning of the season, we'd done so well last season. We'd came second in the league. We'd, you know, we got to the FA Cup final. We'd um, got into the Champions League qualifying stages and then obviously got knocked out by PSG, which was really disappointing. Um, but there was no no real reason at that time why we wouldn't have felt like we could have maintained the feeling and the form and the consistency defensively and and attacking wise that we had last season. And it's been tricky. It's been tricky in terms of winning and the performance and the level and uh, the resilience of being hard to beat that we had last year. It's been a bit, it's felt, we've felt that um, as players that, it's not been all, you know, what is it? It's something in gravy or, you know. I've got to go. I, I get what you're saying. Um, I, I think also maybe it's part of that kind of lesson that we're, we're maybe all learning as pundits or fans and, and players is that, you know, we over the years we've had teams that have done really well for a season and we instantly think that's it, that's them at the top level. And actually it's about building those foundations and it might mean taking you know, that step back or step down, like step back a little bit and then you'll move forward again, hopefully next season. But it's about like everything doesn't, we've seen it with what Tottenham and we saw it with Villa as well this season. You know, they have such great seasons and then they, they step down a little bit and then hopefully it means that like Tottenham have done this year, they step back up. That was the exact question I was going to bounce off your answer with, like literally exactly <laughs> that, about how it's the consistency is I guess the next part of the journey, isn't it? Like, you might achieve yeah. it once, but it doesn't mean that's it. You've got it and it continues. It's part of that. It's yeah. not linear, right? Yeah. And I think that what separates the really, really top and dominant dominant teams in the league from the rest. So let's say, let's take Chelsea for an example, is that if they had a period of two months where maybe they didn't get as many wins as they wanted or their form wasn't great, because they're, they've been so dominant and been so successful, I don't know because I've never been in their changing room, but I imagine that they would say something like, you know, this is a chapter and let's turn the page and we'll we'll have a better chapter. Now, if you're lower in the league, so you're not able to draw on you know, memories of silverware as easily, you have to create that narrative for yourself. You can't necessarily go, oh, well, that was a funky month. Like <laughs> if I was walking to the shops and I fell over, I'd be like, 
and I'm, you know, winning silverware or never falling over, I'd go, oh, that was weird that I fell over. Well, let's get back up and keep walking. But if you don't have that feeling necessarily of having for years and years been so dominant in the league, then you, it's harder to go, oh, well, that was a bit, that's a bit weird that we didn't win that game. You might start to go, wow, we we really need to, you might put more emphasis on it than it needs to have. You, you start to think it's a pattern rather than anomaly, whereas a, yeah. a, a team like Chelsea can say that was an anomaly and we can not like draw um, kind of like draw too long on it and worry too much about it. Yeah, 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 exactly. So a lot has been made of we had a great season last year and potentially it hasn't been as as successful this year. Well, what's the story that we're going to tell ourselves from that? Is it that, oh, do you know what? That happens in football. We're in an FA Cup final. Let's fight. Let's win. Or, you know, what is the story? And I guess it, that's the beauty of journalism as well, is that we are all telling stories about what's happening and, you know, how entertaining can, can can our stories be? And for us as players, we don't go so much from an entertainment angle. We have to think what's the most motivational story that we can that we yeah. can tell ourselves. Yeah. We also just get really excited when something different happens and we're like, oh my God, this is it. And then you're like, oh, okay, no. Um, it will get there, but... <laughs> And um, I was going to ask about you yourself, you know, you've come back from long term injury. Um, how was that fight to get back to, to full fitness? How's it been? It was a very, it was a really difficult injury. I tore a, a tendon in my quad just like so badly, like so badly. I'd never seen that grading before on a tear on a quad. And I was like, oh my goodness. I cannot catch a break. This is like back to back to back to back. And just when you think you've made sense of a different injury or you close the chapter, this one really knocked me for six because it felt so sort of like a quad tear. What? Like I'd had these dead fruity injuries like ACLs. Um, and then what cuts the legs out from under me is this like sporing quad tear that ended up being really quite bad. Um, and I would keep getting the scans and it just was not healing as quickly as maybe it could have been or should have been. And so it ended up being sort of like five or six months with not a, a lot of like sitting around. And when I say sitting around, I mean, I'm still in the gym, but not necessarily with a sense of direction of what the next two months is going to happen. And what's been strange about this um, recovery is that every injury that I've had, like it will feel slightly different. Like you'll struggle with some things on the pitch and not others. Um, it's no surprise. It's no shock that with the with, when you come back from ACL, sometimes you struggle with confidence going into a tackle. You know, you worry: is your knee going to twist? Is this going to happen? And um, funnily enough, with the quad injury, football-wise, I've felt brilliant. But when I came back, I just felt so unfit. And fitness is something that I feel like kind of comes quite natural to me as a player and as an athlete and so it was really really strange coming back this time and just being so out of breath in training like so out of breath like this is my job I cannot be this out of breath um and I would remember like right at the start when I maybe the start of this calendar year when I would be back in the team training, sometimes our strength and conditioning coach would say like, right, you just need to top you up a bit here or there. Can you do a lap of the field or, you know, something quite straightforward. And I would feel like I was doing a couch to 5k. I would be like, oh, like I might need to walk for a few, you know, a few seconds here. Like this is difficult and it was not meant to be difficult. And so to kind of come from there only a few months ago, to then at the end of the Chelsea game, being able to go, wow, I've, I've just played four 90 minutes in two weeks. And that's like more than I've done in two years. It's kind of like been really like, that's weird. Like that's a real switch up. And so I've been really like kind of, I've been in my own experience, but I've also been kind of looking at it like, oh, that that's funky. Like I didn't, that doesn't really make sense, but it's hopefully at the moment it's, seems to be going quite well so long may it continue absolutely I was going to ask about that kind of mental side of because obviously you have had successive interview, in, injuries that have kept you out for quite a while over, like on and off over the last couple of seasons how how have you managed to deal with that because I can ima only imagine how tough it is not being involved in stuff on the field yeah how do you how do you 
deal with it as a footballer you there's always a plan in terms of rehab so you've always got little steps to look forward to or sort of think right that's the next step um and like for me growing up as a player like my whole life was footy so really uh when I sort of let's say first it became professional and it was all that I was doing I'd kind of come to train and do the gym not really do that much else in the day like come home maybe eat some food. Like if I'm living away from my family, I'm not seeing my family. I'm not really seeing my friends. Absolutely fine if football is going absolutely amazing, which how often is that actually happening? And so when you're really injured, if you're not really getting your kicks from football and it's a bit of like a identity crisis where you think, well, what, what am I actually, what am I doing? You know, kind of not, I'm sort of sat around in the gym because I'm waiting for a scan result in four weeks time. Um, and in the meantime, I'm like not really able to go out and be like super active because we're protecting the recovery. So like, what do I do? Like, do I just sit and watch Judge Judy <laughs> every day for hours and hours? Like that's no way to live. And so it's been like a real soul searching time of just kind of being like, well, you know, what, who sort of am I if I'm not a footballer and having to really think about that in a serious, serious way. Um, and then that weirdly, as I've come back then into football has kind of given me more of a confidence of like, it almost settles you or relaxes you on the pitch in a weird way of, yeah, I found football easier when, in a, in a way, I think I thought it was easier when it was like part-time because you had other things going on in your life. Um, so you could switch off easier, whereas now it's professional. I think sometimes when people look in, they think that the thing that holds players back is that they don't take it seriously enough. And I think actually for a lot of us, it's the other, it's the other side. It's that we take it too seriously. We're like two in the woods. We're two in the trees. What is it that saying? Like, can't see the woods from the trees. We're like way too in the trees. We're too zoned in on everything. We're watching the game back multiple times. We're watching every kick that we've made. We're like obsessing over things that are like not really going to make as much of a difference as we think and kind of like lose the feel of it. Um, so, yeah, as you can tell, I've been had a lot of time to think about these things. <laughs> Um, of course, you're back in the Ireland squad uh, now as well. What was the last camp like? Obviously, you had two tough games. Or you're, they're all tough games now in, in League A, but um, what did you make of the, the performance in that that period? It was, it felt, oh, it was just so amazing to be back properly and fit. I'd managed to get on the camp back in February. And when I look back in hindsight, I probably wasn't like 110% fighting fit. I don't know if I would have admitted that to myself at the time, but having felt how I feel now, I know that that's not what I felt then. Um, and so when I obviously back from this quad injury and it was an MCL injury before that, I thought, right, I'm going to, you know, dart back onto the scene and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be great. I'm going to la la la. And actually I didn't end up being needed to be used on on the pitch that much. And so it was a bit of, it was a real mixed emotion of the excitement of getting back into the squad and then sort of that feeling of, oh, I'm I'm not really contributing as much as I'd like to on the pitch. Um, That's something that's special about the Ireland squad is that they have such a strong culture um, that whether you're a starter, whether you're a finisher, whether you're not necessarily going to get used, it's not, that doesn't affect your contribution to the team and the culture and that there's probably not many teams that you can say that about, but as players, we always want to do more. And so to then maybe come into this most recent camp um, league A and just be really part of it and manage to, you know, get some minutes on the pitch and play and feel like in the thick of things, it felt kind of night and day and I just, it just feels like a whirlwind, an absolute whirlwind. And Aviva was incredible, absolutely class. Um, really, really, really good. Like when you're a kid and you watch on television and you go, wow, oh, that's really cool. It was like that. It was really, really cool. I, I was going to ask about the Aviva because that, I think especially in that last like 15, 20 minutes or so, the noise just ratcheted up so much as, you know, Meg Campbell throws those throws or Louise Quinn goes up front and almost scores. Um, it, like every, every move that you, you made in that game in that last 20 minutes, it just seemed to amp the crowd up even more. And that must 
feel really special as a player and really motivating, I guess. Yeah, 100%. I think when we came in at half time, it was quite clear that we'd maybe given more respect than we needed to. And that's that wasn't necessarily what we set out to do. We'd set out with like a solid game plan, but we probably could push on them a bit more. And then when we came in at half time and we found ourselves 2 0 down, um, we said, right, we need to, we need to like do a bit more here. We need to go for it. We need to take some more risks. We need to jump on players of the ball. Like we don't need to necessarily just completely sit under the ball. And so we did that. The the crowd just like got behind us, and then we felt it as players. And from speaking to like the girls on the England team, they felt that as well. Like it was quite clear that the atmosphere was incredible. And so it's that question of like, so, okay, if you had a redo of that game or as we will do, like what, how do you pitch yourself? Um, Can you, can you play like, how long in a game can you play like that? Where's the balance? So it felt like really we'd swung from one end of the spectrum to to the other and the growth of of our team is going to be knowing where we can pitch ourselves. That's a tricky thing right now, isn't it? Because like, having that really good League B campaign where you're against teams that you know you can go out and attack and score goals against and then coming back into a League A a bit like what was at the World Cup last summer where you know you're facing teams higher ranked than you are so it's about how how you how you pick or pick or choose how to play those moments when you're playing France or England or even Sweden um, and how you decide when to go forward and it's, it's, that, it's quite tricky I imagine. Yeah, yeah, you've summed it up perfectly and then if you do, as a team, decide that you're going to concede some space and you're going to maybe sit under the ball a little bit more than you would if you were going player for player, there's also like the psychological impact of that, which is maybe what we faced at half time, where you think, well, you know, psychologically, we, we're better than this. You know, this is not what the fans have came, came to see. Yeah. Um, we can push on more. And so it's that kind of, it's a bit in between, like you say, um, I wasn't, I didn't manage to be in, involved with the previous campaign, but the girls were incredible, scoring loads of goals, more pos- more progressive football, lot, lots more of like, you know, possession based to then sort of pivot in and respecting opponents that are like the very best in the world. Like how much do you, how much do you respect these teams? Um, and you can you can change in the game, but it's hard. It, it's hard because you can't necessarily get info onto everyone on the pitch at the same time. Um, I just find it all really exciting. I think it's really cool. Like really cool that you know the the girls had got us into this group um, that we're going toe to toe with the best. That there's portions of the game in the second half against England where we look like the ones with with the onus and. This all needs to be like soaked in to, to continue to push the team forward. So, you know, as a team, we're excited, but me as a per on a personal note, like coming back in, having been involved a little bit before, it just is very inspiring. It's been a hugely steep learning curve, I guess, with COVID squashing everything back to back. It, I feel like Ireland has gone from, I mean, they're always an underdog, right? But gone from never really knowing how we were going to perform in a in a game to getting the group of death at the World Cup, massively stepping up and showing what you can do in that situation. League B then allowed Ireland to have a bit more freedom and be the team on top. And you kind of amalgamate those two experiences into League A. And my worry was, it was a bit like when a a team has a good season and then kind of dips a bit. I worried that like, would that almost adrenaline or that underdog feeling dip away again? But no, it seems to just be slowly continuing. Do you feel that kind of... What's the feeling like when you're in that squad versus, say, playing for Manchester United? I, I guess, you know, obviously amped up all the time. But like in terms of an underdog experience, do you feel that within the Ireland squad? And is it a huge kind of factor, motivator? Ireland is a... I, I've never been in a team before like Ireland where the, the culture and the identity is so clear. So... I imagine there's like club teams where manager comes in and you try something different and, and it doesn't work. And then you kind of had lost everything that had, that had came before, like looking from the outside um, and being involved in Ireland is like, not like that at all. The characters in the dressing room are just 
like it's in it shouldn't be inspiring like to be around because I should be thinking you know th- this is what I should be, be be like but to kind of like witness like the passion from Katie McKay but at half time and players that just know what they can do what they can impose know what what's not good enough like Kate McKay Louise Quinn um like Denise O'Sullivan like people who just think you know on a day, could you get beaten by tactics and formations and strategies? Yeah, maybe, but you're never going to beat me as a person. And that's something that I just, it's kind of, it's really, really hard to like put a finger on it, but there are like players in that dressing room that think at the end of the day, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you're not going to beat me. The scoreline might be something, but it's like, it means more. Um, and that is, it's really special. Like that's what, as a team, you, you're trying to get a handle on. And you, at most teams, you get it for moments or you get it for parts of a season. Um, whereas at Ireland, that like screams out, that screams out from the players and it screams out at halftime. It screams out from like Eileen's team talks to us, like, we have a, a videographer who does a, a lot of the video in and she puts together the most inspirational videos. Where you just, it just, you, you might, let's say, let's say I, I'm nervous before I know that I'm going to play England at the Aviva as I'm nervous for most games. And then she puts this video up and it's like, it's like the answer that you didn't know that you needed. And I, d- I don't know, I could just, I think we could talk about this all day, but it's really, really special. And so like, I've got two feelings. I'm like trying to be part of that and like emulate that. And what I want people to think that of me, but at the same time, like uh, just appreciating it, um, like firsthand of being like, wow, this is so, this is like, this is what teams are desperate to get a little bit of. Even if, even if that Island team won nothing ever, it would still be so much more special than what most teams might achieve with like cabinets of silverware. And I would not, I would not swap it for the world. I think it's that identity piece, isn't it? I mean, I'm not Irish, but I look in from the outside Pretty and I'm, I'm half, I'm, I'm <laughs> an honorary, I'm an honorary Irish honorary. Um, at times. Um, but I look at it from the outside and there are only maybe a handful of nations, I think, that have that kind of identity piece surrounding them where they're, the emotion around the team and that environment is so much more than maybe just football on the pitch. And I think Ireland embodies that. The anthem. like yeah. I feel like there's certain, you see it in the anthem. It's such a great example of, like Colombia had it, where you don't, I know, obviously I have a connection to Ireland, I'm Irish, <laughs> but like you don't sometimes need to have a connection to the country for you to feel what, almost a bit of what that team is feeling. And I, I love shooting the Irish anthem because I don't think I've ever seen a team other than maybe Colombia sing it quite with so much passion, like every single player as well. Mm, yeah, exactly. And little things like when we were on the way to the Aviva, we were, went from our hotel and we'd trained there the day before. And I felt like the day, I don't know if this is true, by the way, but I felt like the day before we took a very direct route. Whereas it felt like when we went to um, when we went to the match the following day, it was almost like we went on some mad long wavy route. I'm sure we didn't, and I might be making it up, but it felt like we were almost being like paraded around. And when I tell you that, almost everyone that we passed was like waving, cheering, take a little video, like you could see them shouting, "Good luck!" And it's like I've not experienced that anywhere, and you get that sense of. Irish people want want you to do well if you're a part of a sports team. And that sounds like it should be a given. That that sounds like a very like bland statement, but it's not. It's not actually a given at all. And I think the even the the lionesses, like the, the girls on England camp, were sort of mentioning like the excitement that people had even shown towards them for the game. And they didn't necessarily like understand it and I was like yeah like that's what sport means over here in in Ireland and yeah I think it was like it's like weird for them and special for them as well um I I guess finally on on Ireland is that when you look at kind of all of these I guess well how do you view the the group of death because um I guess 
the good thing is that you have a really good chance of, of progressing to the Euros, whether you finish in the top two or, or you don't because of the, the way the playoff system works and, and who, who you might face in that playoff system, say you didn't finish in the top two in, in the group. So how do you kind of view this, gr- this group with kind of that kind of leeway maybe that there is a possibility of, you know, all 16 teams in League A could qualify for the European Championships? It's not really been a talking piece in camp or from the manager of like an acknowledgement of what happens after the after the group. Um, like there are realities around being able to qualify, but that's not really something that we've we've been talking about. Um, we feel like, you know, we're going toe to toe, trying to go toe to toe with the best in the world. So I personally as a player feel quite split in that on paper I know that the the teams that we're playing against France, England, Sweden are very, very good teams. But then when you train with these players that play in the teams, you think you're good, but you're not, you're not without you're not without weaknesses because every single player has things that they're really good at. And because of that, they have to, you know, there are things that are not going to be paid attention to as much. And so I think it's very, like, it can be quite dangerous as a player if you don't see that. Like, if you think that something is all one thing. So let's say as a fullback, I might play against a player who is really good at just, like, running the line. Well, okay, if they're really good at running the line, well, that might mean that when the ball turns over and we're in possession of the ball, that they've not been able to get back. And so it's all swings and roundabouts. And so um, I, I find it hard to, like really buy into like the allure of some of these teams because I'm like girls we train we train with these players like we know they're good but and we know they might be really really good but come on you know they're not they're not without they still go to the toilet you know they're they're not without things that they want to be working on they're human yeah Yeah. (laughs) they are like these let's not add more into it that than than it needs so that's how I feel personally that is not a line that is like necessarily it's not spoken about so directly on 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 camps or anything but that's how I feel well you've got loads going on we're very glad you're you're back in football back playing for Manchester United back playing for Ireland and uh at an FA Cup final no less as well so very pleased to see you back on the pitch um, have enjoyed watching your journey over the 12 years we've been doing this um, and uh, especially delighted that you're in the Ireland squad as well so and I would say that you do look like you never were out you yeah look, you were oh, so good you. against uh, Chelsea at the weekend I was like really appreciate that thanks so much so I would say it's great to have you back too <laughs> yes and thank you for finding some time to talk to us no thanks it's it's always it's always good fun and hopefully we can do it again